Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. To join our community, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and receive the risk reduction checklist I created from the lessons I've learned from all my guests and get my weekly email to help you increase your investment return. Also, in the community, you can get a super special podcast listener discount on my six-week valuation masterclass boot camp. This boot camp is for those who want to learn exactly how to value companies like a pro and advance their career in finance. Just go to myworstinvestmentever.com to join the community for free. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest James Nielsen Watt. James, are you ready to rock? Yes, I am excited. I am excited to have you on. And I know just heard a little bit about your story and I'm excited to hear that. Now, let me introduce you to the audience. James Nielsen Watt is the CEO of Patience and Profits, which teaches health professionals how to run successful businesses so they create more impact. James is also the author of Healthcare Business Secrets, a step-by-step -step guide to growing a wildly successful healthcare business. He is a healthcare professional himself, having practiced in and run his own healthcare business for a number of years before transitioning into the coaching space. James has been featured in Yahoo Finance, LA Weekly, New York Weekly, and other publications, and has worked with hundreds of healthcare owned business owners in over 15 countries, helping them increase their revenue by over $20 million per year collectively, and helping tens of thousands of patients in the process. James, take a minute and fill in further tidbits about your life. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be here and, and I was you know, a little nervous. It was, we're looking at our worst investments and we talked about this pre-show and, and I said, you know, there's a lot of little dumb things I've bought here and there. And, and I think what's my worst investment? And I think for, for me and my story, to give you some context, this is going to be a lot about uh, hindsight and, and seeing things as they are now and as they could have been had I uh, not you know, invested time and energy into things that that I shouldn't have and so um, I grew up um, uh, my father left when I was eight uh, I grew up uh, with my mother and younger brother um, and we didn't have much money home life wasn't the best um, and all of that culminated in me having a strong uh, history of, of chronic anxiety and uh, concentration issues which affected me at school and I was always the bad student who got good grades but didn't put in enough effort and there was there was a lot of self-esteem related things that, that came from all of that and the anxiety for me was to a point where you know I couldn't walk down the street at night without having panic attacks that someone's going to attack me if, if I was at home I would be sitting there alone with a knife next to me you know thinking someone's going to break in I would sleep at night and put plastic bags by the door so that theoretically, if someone comes in, I'll hear them rustling and I'll, and I'll be awake. And, and I remember, you know, I don't know if you've ever experienced terror, like not fear, but just sheer terror. And, and, and I would feel that on, on basically a daily basis about all kinds of stuff. And so there'd be times where I'd, you know, I'd remember sitting in bed at night, listening, looking and staring, hearing noises in my brain, just telling me that someone's climbing my walls to get in or this is happening or that's happening. And this went on for as long as I could have remembered up until maybe what I'm 30 now, so maybe 24, 25 even. And it affected everything, but I didn't know how much it affected it. You know what I mean? Until it changed, which we'll get into in a, in a bit. And mm. suddenly I went, hey, I've invested so much energy and time and emotion into managing you know, the this, this story, these patterns, these beliefs, these feelings, and who could I have been had I not had that? Because of mm. who I've become now, having overcome it, and what I've achieved in such a short period of time relatively, that I look at it and I think, man, what if I didn't have that for the previous 20 something years? Like, holy crap, right? And so for me, it was, it, 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 on the outside, a lot of us, you don't know what's going on. You see mm. someone, you go, they're put together, yep. right? I was very good at looking put together which is why whenever I told anybody, they just didn't believe me. Uh, mm -hmm. And when I even tell it now, people that know me think, oh, yeah, not really, James. And, you know, wouldn't you have told me this or blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, because you don't, you don't get it. 
if you've been through it, you get how the facade forms and it's and you can you can deal with the situation as it comes and you're 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 just trying to keep your shit together. Mm -hmm. So when people are asking you stuff, you're not prepared to then go and tell them because that then opens it up and makes it real. And that's the irony is that by not facing the realness of it, uh, I didn't know that I had anxiety until I was in a psychology class at, at university. Um, and I went, they were teaching us the different things and they said generalized anxiety. And it was like anxious about kind of everything all the time. And I went, that's, I think I've got that. And I think it's pretty bad. And so I went to the front and I told them and I said, yep, you do and i went oh right and it suddenly just made a whole of things sink in i was like oh i've got that but the problem with getting labeled is you've now categorized it i know what it is and it's like okay that's what i am i probably have adhd based on like i never got tested right uh my mother didn't want me to because I, I think she thought that then you know she'd be labeled a certain way and then i'd be given certain things or whatever um but so there's there's that and then there's anxiety stuff and and you know panic attack stuff and and all of this and, and, and you get labeled and you get put in a box and it's like, that's who I am. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you want to jump into to what well, I think. I, I think you're now, doing but... a great job. So you're, you're going through it. So just continue on and tell us the whole story and uh, yeah, we want so, to learn. So, so I was, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm categorized. I'm understanding, you know, what it is, but then you go through this period of like, okay, well, you know, I just, I have anxiety. And there's this, there's this almost sick empoweringness, like, like a, I don't know if you right words codependency. It's like, it's like an abusive relationship with yourself and yep. your anxiousness. That it is your identity, um, but the fact that you cling to it allows you to never achieve more. So it's like if I'm if I'm out in the ocean clinging to you know a piece of driftwood, I'm not drowning. But to get to the beach, I have to let go of it. And I'll justify all day and night as to why I shouldn't let go of that piece of wood. And sure, there's maybe risk. But imagine in this case, my brain tells me that it's a deep ocean and there's, and there's sharks everywhere. And they're going to eat me if I let go of that wood. In reality, it's actually like a one meter deep um, area and I can touch the bottom. Um, and so it's not until you actually let go and and dig into it and face it and, and for me accept that everything's my fault um and once and i'll, I'll speak to that in a second but once you do that you let go and you touch the bottom and you go oh shit actually i just got to wade my way out i'm going to get a bit tired but then i'll be on the beach and it'll be great and so you know lessons learned and and and, and how how i got through it was to accept that i'm at fault like if i'm if i'm suffering that's my choice. Mm -hmm. Things happen. Shit happens. I get hit by a bus. Can't use my legs anymore. Right? That sucks. Can't control that. Yeah. But suffering with <clears throat> is optional. There's an amazing guy. I can't say his last name. Nick Santa something. Santa Mossy or something. He's a Tony Robbins speaker. He's got no legs. He's got uh, one arm and a finger. And I think I've seen dude, him. Yeah, this dude's yeah. incredible, right? And he comes out on stage and it's like, you know, what excuses do you have? And he's just standing there. <laughs> you know, or call it standing, sitting, whatever. And it's like, he's, he's not suffering. And so I started to get exposed to some stuff, some thinking about the world a bit differently and started to challenge it. And, and I got exposed to some interesting practitioners and some alternative therapies that, that helped me become more present in my body. One of them is, is network spiral analysis from uh, Donnie Epstein. Um, and I went and started seeing a practitioner and fast forward a bit what it what it did for me is it put me back in my body so anxiety is your body feels some stuff and then your brain justifies it mm -hmm. and it justifies it from the context of your subconscious so if for example uh i was abused by somebody wearing a, a blue shirt mm -hmm. and i'm feeling anxious and i look around and then there's a person a man standing there in a blue shirt my brain's then going to say, I'm going to get attacked. That's why he's looking at me funny. Something's going to happen. Uh, if I'm feeling anxious and I go, why am I anxious? Oh, I must have left the stove on. My house is going to burn down. My kids are going to die. Like I'm going to lose all my, like it's this, it's this, it's this bullshit story that your brain's giving you to justify this feeling you're having. And so yep. I started coaching people with anxiety and, I, and mm. it came to three things for me. Yep. You've got what your body tells you. Yep. You've got what your, your, your brain tells you. And then what you've got, what your mind tells you. 
Your mind mm. is your consciousness. It's a small mm. part of it. Most of it is our unconscious and our, and our subconscious. Our subconscious is, you know, if I said to you, don't think about an elephant, you picture an elephant because your brain right. doesn't care. It just hears elephant and pictures it. And, and anxiety is not understanding and controlling those things and saying, you know what? I'm not going to put up with this anymore. I'm going to choose not to face the story, not to face the feeling, not to make it real, not to validate it. I don't care how, to, how, how out of control you feel with it. I know the feeling's real. It hundred, it's 100% real to us. Mm. The paranoia, the fear, the panic. But it's facing it anyway and saying, you're not real. I'm not going to let you control me. And in doing that for me is what changed it. And suddenly yep. I started to get clarity over my feeling. I, I understood my heart rate was changing. That You know what? I'm not going to get anxious. Then it was I'm understanding my mind and my brain and my conditioning. And then I'm starting to get confidence that actually I can deal with some of this stuff and I'm going to breathe into it. and I'm going to face it anyway. I'm going to walk down that street you know what? And I don't give an F who's there. No one's mm. there. But my brain's telling me that these people are going to jump right. out and get me, you know? And, and after that, I'm getting confidence. And through doing that enough, I start to recondition my mind enough to gain control. And it's just a continual, just like lifting weights. You don't lift weights once and get big arms, you know, or a big mm. chest. You go consistently and consistently. And then now it is just the default. Yeah. I am beyond <clears throat> not anxious. I am even more positive than that in terms of you know any negative thoughts in my mind don't even precipitate because i've changed how i allow my brain to, to have control over my physiology so so how would you describe the lessons that you learned from this i think the lessons that i learned and this is all hindsight right this is yep. not knowing it in the moment okay this is now doing it and coaching people etc is realizing that the only way to get from where you are to where you want to be is to find people who have done it and then ask them and then get their mistakes and learn from them. Anybody can learn from their own mistakes. I touch the stove, it's hot. I don't, I'm not gonna touch a stove again. A smart person, a truly successful person says, hey, is the stove hot? Yes, it is. And then doesn't touch it. So then they don't <laughs> get burned, you know? And so finding good mentors that can guide you and looking, listening and, and really learning from them. I think that was the biggest thing for me. Mm -hmm. I, I, I pushed against it because I wanted to believe that there was nothing that could be done because it enabled my story, which justified my feelings. And there was fear of change. The irony with stuff is, I think most of us struggle the most with fear of success. Like what if I am at fault for my anxiety and I then decide to do things differently and I decide to not have it by taking particular actions. Like, it's not like I'm going to be not anxious. Like, I'm just going to decide. It's more like I'm deciding to, 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 to make a choice to do stuff that'll eliminate it. If I'm overweight or if I'm unfit, deciding to just exercise will then change it, right? So I'm making a decision, I change. What does that say about me? The previous 20 years having not made that decision. That's scary. I have to accept old James wanted this because new James has now decided differently. And then my friends, because generally speaking, you surround yourself with people that enable you because that makes you feel better. You're not going to hang out with a bunch mm. of billionaires if you're broke because you're going to yep. feel bad and you know, you're know you going to go and hang out with a bunch of broke people and feel good. So it's, I'm going to lose friends. Yep. And you don't, but you think you might. Mm. And that is enough fear to stop people from doing stuff. Yep. So that's the biggest lesson for me. Got it. How, how much like, time I wasted and energy on not just changing. This is such a, it's an interesting story because I know some of the listeners have children or they may themselves be caught up in this cycle of anxiety, cycle of, let's say, uh, let's just say cycle of negative behavior. In my case, when I was young, it was alcohol and drugs. And my parents wanted me to break that cycle, but, you know, I was just caught up in it, you know, and I, I couldn't visualize any other way at the time, you know, except that way. Um, so I, I'd like, you know, this topic is interesting and I've written down a lot of stuff and what I'm, I'm imagining, you know, I had, I used to have a cat. She passed away after 16 years, but, um, <clears throat> when she was young, there was somebody that kind of, I, I would say harassed her, maybe not abused her, but harassed her so that she was, um, always having to kind of defend herself from being poked. And then the rest of her life, when anybody would get close to her she would have a reaction to want to get away from them. 
And she never had any ability to overcome that. And so she spent her whole life in fear, even though the person that harassed her was gone and other people weren't going to harass her. But humans, we have the choice. So then I was just trying to think about your story and trying to put it in context, because the reality is, is that usually we have something that kicks off our story. It could be, you know, abandonment. It could be abuse. It could be something that triggers us to some behavior. But then we repeat that behavior. And I, I, I'm just thinking of kind of a fun example would be, imagine someone, you know, broke into your house and you're a kid, you're home alone, your parents are hot, you know, whatever, like there's nobody around. And then they, they wrap you up in rope. They don't wrap you tight. They don't tie some massive knot, but they just go a hundred times around you until you've got this kind of loose rope around you. And they sit you down in a chair and wrap you in that chair. And then they leave. So how long are you going to sit there? Mm. You know, and that's part of what I'm just thinking about is that for some people, they will literally sit there and die there because they just can't unwrap those robes. Whereas another person may just say, I'm getting out of this right now. And they just shimmy their way out of it. And so were the ropes your fault? No, no. Somebody brought that to you, just like the cat, you know, in, in my life, somebody brought that to you. But now the question is, and as you said, suffering is optional. So when I, you know, I wrote down a lot of things about what you said, but I, I'm not going to talk much about them because I just feel like uh, the biggest value of your story is how do we help that person break free? sooner rather than later eventually they're going to break free but you know why why sit there for six days and starve yourself when you could actually be out on day one so what i want to ask you is based upon what you've learned from this story and what you continue to learn what one action would you recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate I want to I wanna really quickly add to what you said. Yep. I think that we all hear about the one thing and we always try and find the one thing. I think what's mm -hmm. scarier is that most of us are being conditioned by small things over time. You can mess a kid up by just not quite being there for them exactly how they need when they need it. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of any one big thing happened, but what happens is society says, well, you didn't get raped, you didn't mm -hmm. get abused, so therefore what your feelings invalid compared mm. to this person or me they're not they're not respecting the feeling as it exists yep. and that tr you know death by a thousand cuts is real and i think that all of us uh, until we accept that we we don't really see it for what it is which is it's an over time it's this depression over time a beating down these things are spirals depression is just you are unhappy and mm. stopped trying to get happy at yeah. some point you just decided to stop trying and then I know people are going to hear this and say, oh, I try. It's like, yeah, but yeah, I don't want to get too into this, but like there's trying and then there's doing. And I think the one thing for me is to, the way that I look at everything is if it was hypothetically, you know, I know it might not feel like a choice, but if it was hypothetically a choice, what would James, a non-depressed version of me, what would he think and believe and do in his life compared to what I'm currently doing? just being curious, throwing out hypotheticals. And the reason I say it like that is we all have conditioning and we mm. get triggered. Triggers are our choice. You could say, James, you've got, you know, lots of hair. That's horrible. I could say, you know, Andrew, you don't have lots of hair. And either way, I can be triggered depending on what society says is okay, which is all a construct. Mm. And so ultimately my, my reaction to it is a, is a choice, right? So when I'm looking at that, it's like, what if James, it was not depressed. What would he think, feel, believe, act, do? And this is what Tony Robbins told me. It's like, well, he would probably look at things differently. He'd probably ask different questions. He'd probably read different information. He would probably make different actions. You know, James would probably be going out and hanging out with his friends. If he doesn't have any, he'd probably be meeting people and talking to them. He'd probably consider that people are, you know, positive and can bring positivity to his life. He probably wouldn't view people as being negative and horrible to him. Um, whenever he felt you know, good, he'd amplify it. And whenever he felt bad, he'd probably try and go and do some stuff to make him feel good. 
he probably mm. wouldn't think about the stuff that he can that, that he can't control like the weather the president etc he probably think about the stuff he can control he'd probably not watch the news he'd probably filter the information into his head a lot more um, and he probably wouldn't think of himself as a victim he'd probably think of himself as a creator of his future and his, and mm. his life and mm. i think if we all just play that mental game a little bit and what if and just be curious to you know you can do it in anything i'm broke because well, i lost good. all my money what's good about I'm, this i want to be rich whatever you know you're doing it go ahead kind of an alternate version of yourself because if you look mm. outside and say well what would so and so do well that just doesn't relate you know but what would a different version of you do i like that i like that the story i love to tell with this uh, real quick is if is if you've got kids and they're in a burning building and they're going to die and there's alligators in a river and there's you know barbed wire fence so you're going to say oh it's too hard i tried to save my kids no you would jump that fence you'd kick those alligators in the face and you'd climb that building and you'd burn to death trying to save them there was a there was i read a story i don't know how relevant it is now i think it might have been recently i can't even remember a woman had like six kids and she was home alone with them and her building was on fire and she got 93% burns all over her body. And she, I think she saved all of her kids or something like that, or mm. maybe only one of them died or whatever. Mm. And she burned herself half to death to save her kids. Right. Why? Because she had a very clear outcome what she wanted and she had very strong reasons why. And if you are anxious or depressed or unhappy or unsuccessful, chances are you don't have a clear what and you definitely don't have a clear why to take enough action because am I going to, try and kick the fence once and say, ah, oh, fence didn't fall down. Sorry, babies, you're going to burn to death or I'm going to keep kicking until my leg breaks to try and do everything possible to get that door down, that fence down, those alligators out of the way. That's my point. You correct mm. your strategy and you try again and again because I must, otherwise my babies die. And yep. I looked at, I look at my life like that now, my anxiety, everything, because that's the one thing I learned. Yeah. And I think about, in, I'm in a 12-step program to overcome my substance abuse from a young age, but there's a great line in there that says, if we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we'll be amazed before we're halfway through. And, and I, mm. painstaking is kind of an old word. It's not a common word that we use. And somebody said to me, taking pain. And then it really made me think, you know, like, what does that mean? If we're painstaking about this phase of our development, are we willing to face the pain? Are we willing to, to go through it? Mm -hmm. If we can, and if we do, we'll be amazed. There's a whole world out there. There's a whole world out there. All right, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Um, I, have a, I have a successful business and I'm driven by the impact that it makes. And so it's become more and more apparent that the more I focus on the value creation and the people that i can help the more abundance comes that allows me to reinvest into my family uh, and into what i'm doing to create more and so it's become my obsession to just grow the crap out of what i'm doing because of the impact that it has and how fulfilled i am so uh, yeah. our mission is to, to to triple our client volume in our business because i help people who help other people and mm -hmm. when they're all helped their families get help so i feel like i'm such a part of so much change that it just it gets me going every day so it's like a very boring one but that's my thing because i see the abundance coming to me i see the abundance coming to my clients and i know what it's and their patients my kids. and their families and their patients. exactly yeah exactly. it's a ripple effect yeah and uh, what's the best way for people that like what you do and like what you say to get in touch with you uh, if you just look up my name, James Nielsen Watt, it's not really going to matter how you spell it as long as you put it in that order with Google, it'll find me. Um, you can check out my website, check out my podcast, James Nielsen Watt Show. We interview interesting and inspiring people to understand their success and, mm. and what it takes to win in all aspects of life. And, and it's really when I bring all of my, my thoughts, feelings and, and stuff into. So definitely. Check Fantastic. It out. Fantastic. And we'll have all that in the show notes, ladies and gentlemen. And that, that is... Um, <laughs> A great story and it's another story of loss to keep all of us winning my number one goal for the next 12 months is to help you my listener reduce risk and re increase return in your life to achieve this i've created the community at my worst investment ever.com so come and join and if you're interested in learning about valuation get the special discount on the six-week valuation masterclass boot camp we start in just two weeks 
And as we conclude, James, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? You know, go out there and realize that, that you have more control than you think you do. And, and, and we, all, we all can achieve more, but it's our choice as to whether we will. So go and be resourceful, as Tony Robbins says. Um, because it doesn't matter what you have or don't have. It's the resourcefulness that will get you what you want. Beautiful. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our wealth and our health. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.